um, welcome to the program, Climate New. Tonight, our goal is to create an impact on each one of you on just how important the phrase saving our planet can be. We hope to widen your understanding of all environmental issues that are being affected by climate control and how you are, you can become an active supporter of sustainability in our community. I think you will see and you will learn about many local groups whose ingenuity and scope will utterly surprise you. We hope you take this inspiration and find ways to contribute to this endeavor. I am Carol Stewart Brinkus, known as CSG. I'm program chair of the Sterling Garden Club, known as SGC. <laughs> as a 30-year resident of Sterling and longtime member of the club, my life on the not a throughway end of rural Rug Road has thrived amidst the land boundaries of both Davis Farm, Clearview Farm, and the Bolton Orchards growing fields. My brother-in-law, Dave, hays three times a year, weather permitted, in select stone-walled fields surrounding the 100 acres and four Grinkus households, the compound, we call it. I am truly a product of my environment. In 1934, the Sterling Garden Club held its first meeting with 13 <laughs> attendees, kind of an ominous number, in the home of Mabel Schenk, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Some of the women present had familiar names like Rug, Kraft, Chamberlain, Wilder, Sawyer, Osgood, and Trash. Seems like a law firm to me. <laughs> um, while our current motto speaks to the love of gardening, protection of native trees, plants and wildlife, and civic beautification, the additional words of our current president, Mary Roy, in the back, says, set the tone as an ecological support, providing knowledge and resource for our community. So here are a few things that we have begun to take action on. Our club maintains the two beds at the Welcome to Sterling signs. The old trough on the common, the white fence between the stores on Main Street, and the median garden at Crazy Corners. You will see our members staffing and judging the floral entries at the Sterling Fair every September. Sharing with the seniors here for make and take, we Yes, I can't read it now. <laughs> you want my glasses? Uh, no, and even next Monday, with the youngest goblins in town at the annual Spooky Walk. We hold a homegrown plant sale on the common in May, and a talented member display at our holiday green sale on the first Saturday in December at the 1835 Town Hall. We are one of many clubs that belongs <coughs> to the Garden Club Federation of Massachusetts. We are proud supporters of New England Botanical Gardens at the Tower Hill in Boylston and the Massachusetts Horticultural Center, Elm Bank in Wellesley, with an extensive library, test and show gardens, and classes for enthusiastic gardeners. Our affiliation with the Stillwater Farm interpretive site on Route 140, next to the Sabotashcott Farm and the Over Easy Cafe, launched many years ago when a member of the Mass Audubon sent a plea asking for colorful window boxes to please spruce up the remaining Ronsky farmhouse that she passed every day on her way to work in Princeton. We obliged in a small way then, but in 2010, we went big and won a grant from the Garden Club Federation to restore the overgrown and neglected gardens. Clean up new plantings, botanical name tags, and a garden statue of recycled farm tools appeared. A new entry walk, using recycled bricks, of course, was installed um, with the help from the DC Rangers. Now, holiday decor adds a spark when gardens sleep. 
students and historians visit to see a large table diorama telling the story of the res reservoir excavation and the water, the water project. Hikers stop to trek and photograph on the two short nature trails. We now return to Stillwater every September for our opening meeting. As program chair since 2020, ugh, <laughs> I have had to, to be very resourceful in finding relevant topics and people to fill our third Thursday morning meetings. COVID kept speakers on the list, shared by most clubs, off the list. Frustrated members everywhere were struggling to learn the tricks of Zoom, especially challenged by crying toddlers at their ankles, and focus problems that created ostrich necks on weary house arrest gardeners. Local resources were my answer. Travel was little, venues in plein air, very healthy, and talent waiting to be kept. So as a result, our first lesson began at Stillwater with a Bartlett tree expert pruning and sp the sprawling tree we previously donated to the landscape. A tented orchard tutorial and a panoramic lunch at Meadowbrook was a welcomed outdoor venue. An enthusiastic couple, part of the movement to save the nearly extinct majestic chestnut tree, made us all tree huggers. And we celebrated with the grower of air plants whose new botanical career sprouted when health issues made her change her lifestyle. Our eye-opening visit to Fat Daddy's Aviary on Chestnut uh, Chase Hill Road made us see what is possible when you believe you can make a difference. We heard beekeeping sagas of uh, crazy weather, predators, and equipment failures creating havoc and the smallest insects threatening hydroponic groceries. Masked, stir-crazy gardeners came to the Legion and were amazed by maps showing the number of sterling properties now preserved by the efforts of the land trustees. And later meetings from the DCR who presented with an extensive video library on vernal pools, forestry planning, water pollution, wildlife studies, and salty roadways. It showed us just how critical climate control of our environment is becoming. How will our own Lake Washakum fare <coughs> through the, um, the climate crisis? And what is in store for the ecological preservation on the expansive Wachusett Reservoir? It's the second largest water source in our state. Did you know that it provides a clean water source and underground transport over many, many miles to Boston and all its municipalities? Three rivers flow into the massive cauldron, which is stocked with trout, salmon, and bass for local fishing. No trout water. <laughs> and uh, you need a license April to November. <laughs> Will it run dry or become a, a, a polluted if we are not its stewards? Recently, I met with principals Citro and Lebrecht at the, at the Houghton Elementary and the Chocolate Middle Schools to share our program plans. Enthusiasm for our efforts was encouraging, and they surprised me with new news of many ongoing learning experiences for students to who are interested in environmental awareness. Did you know that there's a fifth grade teacher who leads the student conservation team? who grew vegetables in raised beds and planted a tree on the school property. How ironic for me to see this group championed in a half-page ad the following day in the landmark. Very, very exciting. Bravo. Maybe some of you heard about our program tonight via the parents' letter sent home last Friday from each school. Maybe one of your children will introduce you to the climate crisis facing our Earth, or tell you they want to become a geologist or a habitat biologist. As we move forward, we hope to create a member liaison with each school so that the concerns of the ecologists, gardeners, and students will build 
a local stronghold for change. These two and a half years of homeschool events have already raised our own group consciousness at the Garden Club. Tonight, we collaborated with our Save the Planet crew, they're here in person, to give you all some food for thought. We hope the message will inspire you to find your own way to pay it forward. Remember, it takes the village. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Darren Borge. I'm the general manager of the Sterling Municipal Light Department. I've been with the department since 2008. I was actually born and raised in Sterling. My parents still live in Sterling, and I'm a very proud member of this community. I was raised in the community with a lot of friends and family and uh, relatives that still live in the community, so I'm very proud to be working at the Light Department as long as I have and continue to do so. Uh, as part of our video, much like what Carol said, uh, for some of you that may not have seen it or to get a better history of what the Sterling Municipal Light Department is, how we started and where we are today, I'll uh, give you a little presentation of our video. At the 1910 town meeting, we voted to issue notes for a system of electrical lighting, specifically to light the town ways and buildings. We created a board of commissioners to have charge of installing that electric light system. The Sterling Municipal Light Department was born. We began providing you energy to first light up your homes and eventually your businesses. We gave you energy to harvest the apples, to store them, or to make the cider, to build more homes and schools. And as the town of Sterling grew, we grew. In 1935, we moved from a garage on Maple Street to the old high school on Main Street. We built a substation there to better distribute the energy you needed. We reached out past the hay fields and many farms, setting more and more poles, doing our best to get electricity to everyone who wanted it. We watched horses be replaced by automobiles and roads being built. We were here through the Spanish flu, the stock market crash, World War I and World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and many other events that shaped this great nation. The thirst for electricity continued to grow in Sterling from a few streetlights to lights in homes, to water pumps, refrigerators, and ovens, and TVs, and to the many other appliances that made our life easier. Soon people recognized what we already knew. With Lake Washakum and the many apple orchards, what a great town Sterling was, and they arrived here with their families, built more homes, started businesses, and became members of our community. The SMLD was here through all of this, building a more reliable substation, setting up more poles and running more wire, all while trying to maintain competitive rates and reliable service. We were not perfect. Mother Nature had a way of keeping us in check, and just when we thought we were getting good at reliability, along comes the ice storm of 2008. If you were here, you knew it. If not, you were lucky. With most of our system on the ground, it would be 14 plus days before some people saw power, and we would spend almost $1.8 million in a month to put it back together. After the ice storm, we began improvements. We put in one of the first advanced meter infrastructure systems in the area. We replaced our outdated Emeticon system with the state-of-the-art Yukon system. This allowed us to better manage the distribution system by controlling usage and lowering peaks, saving you money. We continue to look for ways to save you money and provide better service. We implemented a portal to view your usage, rebates for energy efficient appliances, and embracing technology and listening to your ideas, we brought you SEDC. This provided multiple ways to receive and pay your bill. We didn't stop there. By partnering with our largest customer, we were the first in the area to install a utility-scale solar array that provided low-cost carbon-free energy. And combined with our second 2-megawatt solar array, made us number one in the country for solar watts per customer. We continued by bringing you one of the first utility-scale battery projects to New England. This has lowered transmission costs, provided resiliency, and attracted visitors from 18 different countries. You asked for access to solar, so we developed the first in Massachusetts community solar with storage. These projects made us first in the nation for storage watts per customer. 
We lowered our rates nearly 25%, rebuilt both our buildings, and incurred zero debt. Funny thing happened along the way. As we rolled out new assets, we needed more data, better communication, more speed, and in true SMLD fashion, we would do it ourselves. After three years of reviews, studies, and conversations with other municipal-led departments, we began to build, assisted by a grant from the state, and working with other MLP line crews, we installed a 432 fiber cable from Shrewsbury Light Department through Boylston, West Boylston, New Sterling, into the Leinster Town Line. We then continued to connect town buildings together in the center of town. It was here we realized we may be onto something. If we can provide $66,000 a year in savings to the town, what can we do for you, our customers? So after 110 plus years of providing you electricity, and during a year when the pandemic took over, our building may have been closed, but our minds remained open. Open to the idea that SMLD could provide the thing people needed the most right now. Fast, reliable internet. Brought to you by your local light department. We now bring you Local Area Municipal Broadband, or the LAM. So, yeah, so uh, much like what was in the video, uh, talked about many of the large scale solar arrays we've installed in, in town. We have about 6.7 million kilowatt hours of solar connected to our grid at all times that are right here in Sterling. Since 2011, we've generated over 48 million kilowatt hours of solar electricity. That's enough energy to, uh, to power every average home in Sterling for two years. Uh, throughout the, the major solar arrays, we have three uh, large-scale utilities, five commercial units, and 40 residential units distributed throughout our entire network. Uh, much like in the video set, we were number one in the, we were first in the Northeast to put in a utility scales uh, battery storage unit, which is located at our substation on Chocksit Road. Uh, that is the unit on the left hand side. And then with the, we've had 18 different countries come and visit that uh, battery storage unit from Germany, Sweden, Japan, Taiwan. A lot of different language barriers. We had to you know, jump over and get through some of those conversations. Uh, but with the, the amount of press that we got from our first battery, we started getting a lot of vendors that wanted to get into Sterling because of all the attention we were getting. And that's what then uh, moved us to the community solar battery, or community solar with that battery storage, which is a unit on the right-hand side. And that unit is located on Chocksit Road as well. Uh, in 2013, we we're number one in the nation for solar watts per customer. So based on the amount of solar we had and customer counts that we had, we had the most amount throughout Sacramento, Light and Power, San Antonio, all these large scale utilities. This little town of Sterling was number one in the country, so we we're very proud of that. And then again, in 2017, with our implementation of our first battery storage, we were number one in the country for our battery storage per customer. And once again, beating out the Sacramento Lights and Powers and all these big IOUs, investor owned utilities, and uh, cooperative utilities throughout the nation. Uh, the SMLD's uh, power portfolio is built up of 72% non carbon emitting or of renewable resources. Those renewable resources and non carbon emitting are from solar, hydro, wind, and nuclear. Uh, it's benefited us very well by that's how we're able to maintain our competitive cost rate in the conditions and markets that we're seeing today. So, um, you know, that was a lot of work from our previous general manager, our previous boards that were very preemptive and wanting to get into the renewable uh, spectrum of the power supply a lot earlier than when it's started to become mandated for utilities to do so. Uh, the thing going forward is technology now. There's so many different power generation technology that are really catered towards the renewable and non-carbon emitting aspect of power generation. And a lot of those with green hydrogen, small modular nuclear, 
tidal, geothermal, and uh, the advancements of wind, uh, wind generation and the re uh, resiliency and reliability of wind generation. Uh, much like what tonight's program is about is how to educate the community on things that you can do to lower your carbon footprint or become more energy conscious. We have a multitude of different programs through Energy Star rebates, home energy audits, uh, rebates through heating and cooling, connected home programs, which have incentivized programs for customers to enroll Wi-Fi enabled devices that we could then uh, peak shade with those units if it's a nest thermostat, just be able to, in the summertime, increase the temperature a little bit, reducing our power load, which saves everybody money. So if we can reduce our peak capacity, it saves the entire town money. So that's where we really pride ourselves on our peak shaving capabilities and reducing our transmission obligation it's during those high peak periods. Um, for any more information that you want or a copy of this uh, presentation, you can find it on our website. Our website is www.energysterling.com and you can access through any of these rebate programs and different appliances that we have that rebate value for those uh, devices as well. Our next speaker is uh, Tom Wenzelvon. Oh, full disclosure, he's from Mass Wildlife and I just retired from the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife this spring. So we have a history. <laughs> we have knowledge of one another. Tom is a habitat biologist with Mass Wildlife, um, which is their state fish and wildlife agency. His, uh, he's got a bachelor's degree in natural sciences and a conservation biology master's degree. And he's been with the division for about six years, he's figured out. At least he's not saying too long. <laughs> you can't say that until you've done as many years as I have. <laughs> and um, before he started working with the division, he was the in charge of stewardship for the Mount Grace Land Trust up in uh, northern Worcester County and uh, Franklin County. And, um, and he was... Uh, he, he did that for 10 years. So he's got a lot of experience of doing land management. The habitat program at the Division of Fish and Wildlife is doing a lot of different projects in different parts of the state. Um, being a local sterling person, I'm happy to direct you to a couple of uh, the properties that, that are go undergoing some active management. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, hopefully everybody can see the slide up here. but. Kind of the way my presentation, what I want to talk about, is really trying to take a look at things like full circle. We really need to kind of look at the past to really understand where we are today and where we're going into the future. And as somebody that manages habitat and has done land protection, looked on the ground, New England is probably one of the most richest places to really see how sweeping land use changes have affected everything that's around us. And as you start to study those and you start to learn them, you see those indications all throughout our landscape around here. And that's one part I want to talk about because in order to understand the climate and where we are at and how habitat management affects that, we really need to know what the past was here in New England. And so I want to start with the very long past and what I tend to call the forgotten 12,000 years of American history. Starting with that the Americas were a highly populated place for thousands of years. In fact, when Columbus sailed, more people lived in the Americas than in Europe. We're talking complex cultures, like the mound building cultures, like here in Cahokia and the Mississippi Valley, complex cultures, extensive trade routes, like you can see in the map up here, different materials from all sorts of different places being traded around, and the influence of indigenous cultures and indigenous societies on the landscape was tremendous. Um, with that many people being able to feed them, being able to live, they had a significant impact on the landscape that when I was growing up wasn't even barely even talked about. I never even learned about it, didn't even know. But unbelievable. In fact, um, where I used to live in Key, New Hampshire, a archaeological professor at Franklin Pierce was excavating a site up there where they were building a middle school. It was a Paleo-Indian site, 12,000 years old, and the stone tools they found there came from rock 
that only could be found up in Berlin, New Hampshire, or the western mountains of Maine. That, at that time, 12,000 years ago, would have been a three-month journey. So you're already looking at lots of trade already going on, movement of goods that long ago, and that was 12,000 years ago. So we can't even fathom what the Americas were like. So what did the landscape look like? The landscape was very different than what we see now. We're talking a very open landscape, especially here in southern New England. One that was tended by fire. Fire was used extensively by indigenous cultures all throughout the Americas and here in southern New England. It, we had diverse woodlands. I mean, these are what we would call a suite of open habitats, from grasslands to open woodlands um, to heathlands that create a very rich, very diverse uh, landscape, a very patchy, a big mosaic with rich understories of different types of plants. Because if you think about what people were using for cordage, for medicine, for foods, it wasn't things that were up in the canopy of a tree, they were all on the ground. Massive numbers of grazers, I mean we had herds of deer, different species, and you can even see this in some of the quotes, referring to elk and deer in the spring, one could see as many as a hundred of them in the space of a mile. Oh, somebody's bad. Yeah. It's bad. Um, bad. And agriculture was a relatively new phenomenon, and many people talk about like the Three Sisters, but that was only relatively recently. For thousands of years before that, there wasn't agriculture as we knew it now. People were tending it, but they weren't like actively growing like row crops. They were taking things and using fire to basically tend that landscape. And there is an extensive body of scientific research. The paleoecology record is clear and supports this. And the historical accounts, when people were showing up in the Americas, well, English or European people were showing up in the Americas, is paramount. From southern Maine to Hudson, the woods were open and park-like. They talk about this one near Boston, from which one could see thousands of acres with not a tree. It was barren. William Wood in 1624, many places, diverse acres being clear so one may ride a hunting in most places of the land. At a number of sites, trees were entirely absent. But within the watercourses, often preserved large areas from the fires, many of them lit, set by Native Americans, Indians that cleared the underbrush everywhere, leaving the thickest through which it was impossible to pass. So again, this fire landscape, areas that were burned, Except for in the wetlands, those were the thick areas that were there. Um, you look at like the history and the, the accounts of like the town of Brookfield. They talked about being able to see areas for three miles. We're, we're not used to even thinking about that around here, with our dense forest that we have around here. Very open. And if you look at this, so the map up here, that's the estimated historical extent of open forests in the United States. So these woodlands, these savannas, grasslands, and you can see Massachusetts, which is in this area called Open Forest, but you see like over in the Berkshires and the higher elevations, which were our, our typical northern hardwood forest doors were closed. So we were on this like complete transition line. But all down the east coast into the Midwest <coughs> were extensive uh, open forest, open oak savannas, pine savannas, tended through fire. Um, and it was very, very clear in the record that that is the case. And the research is much more pronounced from kind of the southern Appalachian area, but we're seeing more and more coming up here. Um, and this is from a research paper um, from a, a researcher named Bryce Hanbury. But we also had other natural disturbance agents of change. This, these two pictures right up here on the left and right, the top, massive ice scouring. They call this Riverside Ice Meadows. And big chunks of ice coming along in the springtime, spring floods coming down, do, ripping along the ice banks, creating these grassy kind of early successional areas, maybe not every year, but every other year, kind of fairly frequency every five years. Um, we don't really have that much anymore. We've controlled the flooding and because we don't want people's houses flooded anymore. But th we can't even imagine this phenomenon that was happening all over uh, the United States. Then in the bottom right, the passenger pigeon. You hear historical accounts. Three days these birds would be flying darkening in the sky. We couldn't even imagine what that would look like. But 
the impact on the land, and you've heard a lot of researchers talk about this, that many birds, millions, millions of birds <coughs> landing in these trees, breaking branches, defecating, that would cause extensive land use changes in there. It could kill the trees, it could kill the ground cover, open that up, getting that sunlight in there, and again, it's just another disturbance factor that we would see in these areas. Something that was gone. None of us, none of us have ever seen a passenger pigeon. Beavers, another extreme agent of change. Um, extensive beaver swamps on everywhere. You hear from the early colonist records talking about the number of waterfowl here in New England. Waterfowl that would blacken the skies. Not as much as the passenger pigeon, but just as much. The market hunting, they would kill like hundreds of waterfowl in like an hour. We couldn't even imagine that. I duck hunt, if I see like five a day, I'm happy. Um, we don't see any of that around here in New England. If you went to a place like Saskatchewan and the prairies, there you can still see massive migrations of waterfowl. Probably not what they were historically, but um, a, a glimpse into what it used to be. We don't have these extensive beaver swamps anymore around here. Not to the size and the extent that they used to be. We have infrastructure, we can't uh, build up over that. So, all of a sudden, we have all these natural disturbances from indigenous cultures, natural dynamics happening on rivers, beaver, but then we have another whole suite in a very short time of about 500 years of other massive changes to the landscape. Starting within the early 1600s, two major pandemics came through that wiped out and decimated 90 to 95 percent of the indigenous people in southern New England. Uh, especially coastal New England. And very quickly afterwards, it subjected many more of them to, to pandemic death. They had very little resistance, at, at none, to European diseases. We're seeing these complex cultures that I just talked about broken down. Indigenous people are still with us here today, but the numbers and their societies and their influence in the land was decimated by these foreign diseases. We have eras of dam building. If you look on the map on the, on the bottom left right there, all those black dots, that's a dam, every single dam here in New England. Stopping every flow of the river. I mean, it's, it's mind blowing. Um, all, so we're looking at change. Now these rivers cannot have the flooding that they used to be. The, the beaver, the different wildlife that were on there, gone, changed. You know, people, it was for a purpose. People were building mills. They had, to, they had to mill lumber, they had to grind corn and everything else they were eating. There was a reason for this. Um, they, weren't think, they were thinking about their livelihoods. And I'm not trying to vilify what people were doing. They thought that they were doing the right thing at the right time. Um, we have massive tree cutting, this top picture there in the middle. That's the White Mountains, I think up near Crawford Notch in the late 1800s. The whole entire mountainside is denuded of trees. They, you know, I manage and oversee timber and logging operations on state property. And if somebody ever asked me to do something like that, I would use some colorful language and say, you're, you're losing your mind. And that was done with horses and like crosscut saws, not like feller bunchers and mechanized logging. I mean, gone. And, you know, that's where subsequently the Weeks Act came in to protect the White Mountain National Forest. We couldn't even imagine anything like that happening. All that, all that timber gone. Charcoal, up there in the top right. Massive charcoal furnaces we were burning huge loads of wood. The land was being cleared for wood to make that charcoal. Again, another sweeping land use change. Market hunting, again, that picture there in the middle on the right. Decimating wildlife species. I mean, we have seen, you know, beaver were gone, deer were gone, uh, um, turkey were gone, black bear were gone, wolves were gone. I mean, many species that we see today, um, back in the 1800s, would have been on the endangered species list if the Endangered Species Act was around. They were just wiped out. Well, the 1920s, the chestnut blight, one of the key ecological species of our forest, gone. And then we have uh, f uh, farmland being, you know, a lot of our landscape being denuded, chopped up for farmland. Much of that's what we're seeing growing back now. It's just recovering from that era of mid-1800s or early 1900s farmland abandonment. And then the final coup de grace was putting out all the fires in the 1920s, not allowing fire to happen. Smokey the Bear, a result of many of the large wildfires, the Big Burn that happened out west, 
and we see sweeping uh, regulations stopping any type of burning that was happening. Historically, even after indigenous people, many farmers were burning their fields, but after these catastrophic western wildfires, we see policies being made to basically snuff it out, and, and that really was kind of the end of fire in the New England landscape until quite recently. So, given all these like massive land use changes, and all these sweeping things that have happened, the decimation of wildlife, it's amazing that anything ever survived and anything that ever came back that what we see today. Um, but as I said before, those changes are really ed evident all around and we see those out there. And so as like a habitat manager, as a land manager, we're really looking at those things. We're really looking at the history to try to understand how those certain things influence the landscape and how can we use that in a contemporary, uh, in a contemporary habitat management scenario. And if, as I talked about showing these natural disturbances and sometimes somewhat, somewhat <coughs> humanistic, uh, fatalistic disturbances that kind of happen, it's not a coincidence that the majority of our species that are in decline and highly threatened depend on disturbance because we have blocked them. We block the fire, we block the ability for beaver to be around, we block, we block the rivers, we had a lot of things that have really kind of put some barriers on many of these species to be able to survive. In fact, half of the mass endangered species, listed and threatened species, depend on fire influence habitat. And it's no coincidence that because of fire exclusion policies in the past, where people who thought they were doing the right thing at the time, um, that many of our species are kind of declining from that. But Today's day and age, I know many people always really want to know, so what species, when you're out there doing habitat management, what species do you benefit? And yes, there are many, but really we need to broaden our perspective out and really look at kind of the ecosystem as a whole. Our idea is to really have this ecosystem diversity. We're really looking at diversity across the landscape, having complexity in there, having all the pieces, or as Aldo Leopold would say, all the cogs in the wheel. Because I always, if, if you're younger than me, you probably don't remember this movie with Kevin Costner, The Field of Dreams, but if you are my age or older, you probably do remember it. And it's always the, the, the saying of, if you build it, they will come. Because it's really that patchiness, the complexity, and just like in that map shows, that's providing all the nooks and crannies, all the different pieces that wildlife need throughout all their life function needs. Now, I have two birds up here that kind of like exemplify that because one's the rough grouse and the other the wood thrush. Now with the rough grouse, we tend to think that rough grouse need this dense aspen habitat. Now that's true, but only for a certain part of its life stage and only for a certain part of the year. In fact, grouse need mature forest to be able to nest in. They need young forest to be able to forage and to bring some of their chicks in and to drum in, but they also need like early successional, which is kind of like shrubby grassland, to be able to bring their chicks into for bugging and for some of that cover that's in there. Think of like an old field um, for them to come in and be able to find that insects to fatten up and to have cover from uh, certain predators in it that are in there. And they all need it within close proximity to each other. So, Here's a bird that we think needs one habitat type, but it actually needs three or four different type of kinds, all within uh, relatively close proximity. Then you take the wood thrush, which we always call a forest interior bird. Well, in fact, it's a forest interior nesting bird. Now, when its chicks fledge, fledge the nest, they want to go into young forest and early success, success, uh, sorry, successional habitat because that's where all the insects are at. And so they're bringing their chicks in what we would call the post-fledgling stage, they're bringing them into these young forests to these early successional habitats to fatten up before the rivers of migration. So again, two species, we tend to define them on a very single habitat type, but they actually use a mosaic, patchiness. And that is really our goal as habitat managers, is to think on this landscape scale, to think about all those pieces of the puzzle that are needed, and to try to provide all the benefits to a, as wide of a variety of wildlife species, specifically species that are really struggling to be
be able to meet all their life function needs throughout their entire lives and through different parts of the calendar year. And as I said here, we don't manage for, many people ask that, we don't manage for her historical period, but we use that information to help to like figure out how some of these pieces may fit together. And here are some examples from some of the projects that myself and my colleagues work on, just to kind of give a breadth of that understanding of that landscape scale. Here's the Birch Hill Wildlife Management Area. This is in Winchenden, Mass. This was a 150-acre project I worked on, and this is why that we have to work on this big scale. This encompassed restoration of habitats from heathlands, oak savannas, oak woodlands, young forest habitat, abut all mixed in with wetlands, and abutting all mixed up to a river and small creeks. We did a number of activities in there from timber harvesting, mowing, invasive control, and using prescribed fire. You can see in the upper left, the pre-restoration picture, that's what it looked like. Uh, white pine and birch growing in this area. We had a whole tree harvesting logging crew come in, remove a lot of those pines. These were non-fire adapted tree species. Remove those, and that's what you see on the right, that diverse meadow there full of grasses, forbs, uh, shrubs. These are the things especially are critical to wildlife around here. When you think of our forest, what's the limiting factor? It's these open areas. Diversity of, of, of plants in there, diversity of insects, diversity of pollinators. If you look down in the bottom left, that's that same site that we burned last year in April. That's the, secret the former Secretary of Environmental Affairs there in the middle. We burned it with the governor, Charlie Baker, and the lieutenant governor, and the Secretary of Environmental Affairs. It looked like that, a moonscape after we burned it. Two months later, it's growing back. A year later, you can pick 10 pounds of blueberries in less than an hour. I mean, wow. it's the capacity for renewal that is the key to understanding the resilience and for managing these habitats. It's not destroying. These are designed to be able to withstand a disturbance. And a disturbance is integral to every ecosystem, no matter whether it's aquatic or it's forest. There's always change in there. And understanding how those changes affect that ecosystem and the species there is our job as these managers. Quaybog WMA in Brookfield, uh, this is my colleague. This was a 180-acre project um, that we worked on. He worked on pre-restoration. This was a tangled mess of invasive species. Uh, this encompassed restoring warm season grasslands, oak woodlands, aspen stands, and it all budded, mixed in with wetlands and it budded the Quaybog River. Um, we removed all those trees, restored this meadow. You can see in the upper right, that's me, this is a native warm season grassland, little blue stem. Bottom left, oak woodlands in the middle, it's a little green, but that's an aspen, a huge aspen stand we're generating in there. And in the right, that's a field traversing down into the Quaybog River. These are all connected from the wetlands to the uplands, and that's where we work. And we are very careful. We bring heavy machinery into these sites, but we have to do it under certain controlled guidelines and there's certain conditions. Very, uh, um, you have to be very careful about how we're doing that, but that is the important aspect of having that patchiness that habitat diversity from the wetlands all the way up. Because as it said here, and bringing this back to like climate, I know I've been talking about this restoration in land use history, but it comes right into climate. It's very important that restoration done properly can increase biodiversity, restore structure and connectivity, and enhance a variety of these ecosystem services that may better position ecosystems to adapt to climate change, even where the primary intent may have nothing to do with climate adaptation. Because restoring these sites with the native species that are in there and making them resilient to climate change is critically important, and that's one thing that we're doing. And when it comes to carbon and what we're working on, uh, many people, because we are harvesting trees, wonder how much carbon are we releasing? So we did some work. We calculated how much mass wildlife was sequestering carbon from our land acquisition efforts and how much we were releasing from our habitat management activities, timber harvesting and burning. And all the green is all the amount of carbon that's being sequestered. You see a huge uptick in that. What is being released for carbon is that little red line. And for that little red line, we get unbelievable wildlife 
habitat, secure populations of rare and declining species. We have a net annual increase in carbon storage. But I want to bring it back to um, the data and really thinking about when it comes to climate change, what are the main drivers of, that are causing climate change and greenhouse gas emissions? So if we look at the chart on the left, sorry for all the graphs, we can see all the breakdown of what um, is being uh, of the main causes of greenhouse gas emissions. Electric power, transportation, number one. But forestry isn't in there. Because since 1990, U.S. managed forests, they were net same. They removed 13% of greenhouse gas emissions. That means it's working. It's, that's not true in the rainforest where they're being stripped down. But if we keep forests as forests, even if we're uh, harvesting trees off there, it's a working solution. We're not running out of wood in New England. It's increasing. And in my personal opinion, if we're arguing over what's working, it avoids addressing the real issues, which are these massive influxes of greenhouse gases from these sectors. But if we also look and really look at ourselves deeply, if we look at the graph on the right, that's the state annual harvest and consumption in cords of wood. And if you look at Massachusetts, the blue is the harvest of wood that we harvest in the state, very small. But how much we consume is that giant red line. We are consuming more wood than we are harvesting locally. That means we are importing it. That means we are increasing transportation. That means that is not carbon friendly. And if we, if we we're all consuming these vast amounts of wood products. If we ban forestry, we're going to further push it out to import more of it. Because if we look around, look around our house, you'll see everything's made out of wood. We're in dire housing need. What we choose to build that out of is really going to have a big carbon impact. If we choose to build it out of steel, concrete, or plastic, which are highly carbon intensive, we're only going to be contributing to the problem. What is a reno renewable resource? It is the most climate friendly building material. And especially wood from these ecological restoration projects, it is really truly a win-win. And thinking about how our use of wood and how important it is, Here's an example of how wood is being used in structural building. And these are actually real projects that have been done. We see a fire station, structural timbers being put in there, all made out of wood. That's carbon storage in that wood versus concrete and steel. You cannot make concrete without emitting vast amounts of carbon. That's the one on the right. That's housing for people that are struggling with addiction. A big issue that we're having here in Massachusetts. The bottom left. That's a, I believe, a library at a college. And the right is, that's um, uh, apartments, all made out of wood. The research also shows that people feel better when they're living in wood and near wood. And this is where we have to think. We should be embracing these technologies. We should be bringing these to Massachusetts and saying, yes, we want uh, more wood products. We want to be able, or not wood, more wood products. We want to do more with wood. You can make anything you make out of petroleum, you can make out of wood. Maine is becoming the Silicon Valley of wood products and wood technology. And I feel that the rest of us need to jump in on it. But as I end this right now, and kind of bringing things again full circle, when we talk about uh, the land, and we talk about people, and we talk about habitat, climate change, that restoration and the work that we're doing is really about reconnecting land and people the two things that really need each other. And when we start reconnecting people with the land, and we start having that stewardship ethic in there, and really understanding the land, I think we'll really move forward and have a lot more stronger relationship and understanding of our responsibility for the land. And I was just recently up at the uh, Hancock Shaker Village, and the Shakers, they thought that like things from the land were like gifts from God to be used but to be taken care of and not to be wasted. And that really kind of resonated with me because I kind of really feel the same way. I, I thought that was a really great ethos. And because we need each other. I mean, we need to be out there. We depend on everything that comes from the land, no matter what. Um, it's critically important. And so that's all I have. So our next speaker um, is Kathleen Parent, who's the program coordinator for DCR at Wachusett. She's the person that's been doing some of the good things and the partnering with the, uh, the Sterling Garden Club. And she'll talk uh, briefly about um, forestry and water protection. And she's got a very interesting 
video uh, that will talk about a small mammal survey that they're doing on both the property areas where there's forest cutting going on as well as what's happening with wildlife on the, on the non-managed area. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the Garden Club for having me. I'm so excited to be here and share what we're doing in the watershed. So again, I'm, I'm the program coordinator for DCR's Division of Water Supply Protection here at Point Chusset Reservoir Watershed and our own neighbors in the same watershed. So, um, how the land is managed really impacts the quality of the water in the reservoir and for your own water sources. What we love to see is forests um, to filter rainwater, capture stormwater, prevent erosion, uh, store water, and release it slowly. It's one of the best ways to keep the water clean and we have an unfiltered drinking water supply here in the Washington Reservoir. Um, let me get this video up. We need to let talk. wildlife biologist with DCR's Division of Water Supply Protection. For this video, we're going to be discussing our long-term wildlife monitoring project and specifically focusing on the small mammal side of the project. This small mammal project has three main goals. The first is to document what small mammals are present in forested areas of the watershed. The second is to monitor the relative abundance and diversity of small mammals. And the final goal is to see if watershed forest management activities have any impacts on small mammal populations. Small mammals play an important role in the ecosystem. They help to control invertebrate populations and they disperse plant seeds and fungi spores. Their tunnels provide homes for other organisms to use and they are an important food source for many predators such as hawks, owls, and fox. Additionally, due to their high reproductive rates, these small mammals respond quickly to environmental changes, which makes them an excellent study group for evaluating their response to forest management. So what exactly is forest management? Well, the forest management that has or will occur where we are studying small mammals involves cutting small forest patches that are no larger than two acres in size. Tree removal disturbs leaf litter and opens up the canopy, which increases the amount of sunlight that hits the forest floor. This helps to promote regeneration of new young trees. This is important because it helps to ensure that our forests are healthy and continue to grow for generations to come. Healthy forests in the watersheds are critical for filtering and cleaning water, which helps to protect water quality for the 3 million residents in Massachusetts that rely on the reservoirs for drinking water. Our biologists have been studying wildlife communities at 30 long-term monitoring plots on a rotating basis since 2001, but we've been intensively studying wildlife, including small mammals, at five plots annually for the last six years. In order to gather data on small mammals for these studies, we used Sherman traps, a small metal box with a spring-loaded door that are used for trapping small mammals without hurting them. We bait the traps with a peanut butter and oat mixture and also add some mealworms for the carnivores. If you just push it all the way to the back, then uh, the critter has to trigger the trap to get it. If yeah. Mice, when they're walking, they don't like to walk on leaves and stuff that don't make noise. So I'll try to put it next to like a, a dead branch or something on the ground so they can sort of scurry over. The reason why we have two different traps is to catch different animals, like some are too big to go in there or wouldn't go in there, like a lethal water. It's just to remove bias, trap bias. So like something with this thing right there. If you're applying coral, it's easy to move through there. Okay. Then we come back the next day to see who we've captured. We do this for four nights in a row. 
Afterwards, all the traps are removed, and we move on to the next plot. So a lot of small mammals really like the coarse woody debris, which is these fallen branches um, on the ground, and they like these uh, boulders and stuff. We like to put the traps kind of in areas near those spots, and hope that mammals will be using them um, to run along and to uh, find their way into the trap. This site is, uh, has not been harvested yet, so we're still collecting uh, baseline data at this site. Uh, though we'll be able to compare things going forward once it is harvested to see how the wildlife community changes. In the five plots we've been studying since 2016, we have captured 15 different mammal species. The most common is the paramiscus species, mostly white-footed mice, but likely also deer mice. This is a paramiscus species with our white-footed mouse or deer mouse. This is a male. These two species are sometimes difficult to tell apart, so we just classify them under the paramiscus genus. The second most abundant are the redback bulls, followed by short-tailed shrews. So what does all of this information tell us? Only three of the five plots we have been intensively studying over the last six years have undergone forest management, so it is still early in our study. But so far, we have not documented any significant impacts to small mammal populations from forest management. We have, however, recorded some other interesting data. For example, we saw a significant decline in small mammal abundance in 2019 likely due to the caterpillar outbreak in 2018 that devastated acorn and other small mammal food sources. We've also noted that our captures increase during evenings when we have a rain event. We still have many more years of data collection ahead in order to fully determine if forest management has any impacts on small mammal populations. So far, our findings have been positive in that we have not seen a decline in small mammal abundance we have even seen a slight increase in diversity. Thank you for watching. Some of the wildlife footage you have seen is from a new study which uses wildlife observation cameras. Here are a few more clips of small mammals and some not so small mammals that we couldn't leave out. I hope you enjoy.
get yourself onto the waiting list, you can call our front office, ask them about the community solar. They'll get your information that when a spot becomes available, they'll call you and see if you're still interested. And if you are, they'll enroll you into that program where 25% of your monthly usage will come from the power that's generated from that solar facility. Yes. All right. Pretty cool. Hi. Um, a few years ago, I read uh, something about these panels that you could put on your windows that you could see through, but they were solar. Um, is there anything happening on that? Uh, I'm sure there that? is. There's nothing. Rather, rather than buying those big, you know, panels. You can yeah, I, I know there is some technology out there. I don't know the uh, wattage amount that those produce, uh, but. You know, as technology advances, I'm sure something of that nature will definitely advance. You know, so. One question? Yes. Sir. My question was very basic. How are the restorative sites selected? Yeah, no, that's a pretty good question. Uh, we have a, I, I didn't mention this, but I work on an interdisciplinary team of, uh, I work with restoration ecologists from our National Heritage Program, our fire ecologist, fire program manager, and uh, our other habitat biologists. And we collectively decide on, prioritize which sites we're going to work in. A lot of the stuff that I've been working on had already been, is areas that we had already selected before. So we kind of prioritize the best of the best, where we're going to have the biggest impact on the, most uh, species possible. Uh, we but had, they're public sites, they're private, people donate the land, how do you, how do you get the land? Oh, uh, we have a strong land acquisition program. Um, so we have money, um, a lot of it, we have quite a bit that comes from the uh, um, the stamp um, on the hunting license, the habitats, the land acquisition stamp, it's about a million and a half dollars. So anybody that buys a hunting and fishing license, that stamp is required. And then we get another significant amount of money from the open space bond bill. Um, and so we have in each region, uh, we have a dish, five districts. In each district, we have land acquisition people that are actively out there um, working with people, willing sellers. We're not, we don't take things by eminent domain or anything like that. These are people that are willing to sell their land and renegotiate a price with it. And then I'm also on the land acquisition committee. Um, who I represent the wildlife section. Uh, at Mass Wildlife, and we also, we score them and prioritize them. Um, so we have a lot of people, people from fisheries, people from natural heritage, um, so we all kind of look at our scores and combine them all and then uh, prioritize which pieces that we're going to acquire. Um, so, and we, we have a very strong land acquisition program. We're uh, purchasing a couple thousand acres or more um, every year. If you're familiar with state parks and state forests, well, there are state wildlife management areas, which is properties that the Mass Division of, that Mass Wildlife is overseeing. So that's, that's, those are the lands that he's working on. Yeah, but, all public land. But the agency is also working with private landowners and offering grants to private landowners that are, might be interested in doing habitat management on their properties. And there's a grant, a wildlife habitat grant pro program uh, through our agency and there are also federal um, grant programs that property owners can, can look into if you want to do wildlife habitat management. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time.